you all the adoration because you are worthy to receive all the glory, honor, and power. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for loving us even when we aren't expecting it. Father, thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness and your mercy. In the mighty name of Jesus and for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we say thank you. For the love of our Heavenly Father, we say thank you. And for the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we say thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Alrighty, alrighty, alrighty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come on, God is good. Why don't we just give these guys a hand of thanksgiving? Let's just thank them for their service, for their dedication. And let's just thank God for his presence that comes over such worship. Alrighty? We're going to go straight to Matthew chapter 7 verse 14. And you may be seated. Thank you so very much. Oh yes, oh yes. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. There was a time during worship that I opened my eyes. And it looks like someone's connected electricity to the keys. Because Bennett actually looked like he was getting a shock from that thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's how you praise God. That's how you do it. You give it your all. And I just thank God because your leadership is very well recognized. And we thank God for your leadership over the band. And we thank God for the dedication of, the, of every member of the band who continues to give above and beyond. We appreciate you guys. We don't take it lightly. God bless you. And Emmanuel. Wherever you might be in the building, God bless you too. And I pray for you that your hair will grow as far as quickly as mine. You know, because sometimes it's the little things that encourage us. When you look in the mirror, you're not as bald as you once were. Can anybody see Charles in the room? God answers prayers. Come on now. If you know, you know. God is good. Alrighty, Matthew chapter 7 verse 14. Papa Jay, good to see you here. Thank you for the pleasant surprise. It's good to see you here. For everybody, for people who don't know, that's Papa Jay. Our brother James is Kayla's dad and so glad to have you here with us today. Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. All righty. So Chris and Kayla, are they in the nursery today? Okay. All righty. God is good. I can't see them. That's why I'm wondering because I always like to know where Kayla is sitting so I can use her for an example. Matthew 7, 14. The Bible says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it. You know, if the Bible says there are a few who remain in it or who dare to walk it, it will be different than what we actually just read. The Bible says that only a few people find it. Why is that? Have you ever wondered? We're going to get into that in just a moment, but I want to say a prayer very quickly to get us started. We have come to the week. We are meant to be highly expectant. This week that we're in because of the word of the Lord that came forth. You see, the Bible says that we have a hope that makes not ashamed. We are not afraid to have an expectation because the word of the Lord says it. We believe it. And we remain anticipatory until we receive it. You know, sometimes as adults and as people that have been in the religious setting for a long time, we tend to not want to be as expectant because we do not want to be disappointed. Now, when the government tells you something, you may exercise caution in your anticipation because they are men and sometimes they just can't deliver. You see what I mean? When your sibling says, oh, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, sometimes you're like, okay, well, let's examine your track record. Because Jesus says, by their fruits we shall know them. Have you borne fruits of consistency at delivery or consistency of delivery? But you see, when God says a thing, 
you better believe it. Because when God says a thing, he does it. Whether you receive it or not, sometimes, in fact, most times, it depends on whether you believe it. The Bible says with God, all things are possible. So as far as God is concerned, it's already done. The Bible says the word of God is forever settled in heaven. Once God says it, it just happens. Let there be, and there was. There were, when God says let there be, we didn't hear and there was going to be or there was being. No, the Bible says there was. The moment God says it, it was. So when you look at the description of the praise and the worship of the 24 elders and the four living creatures, when they were talking about God, they said he is the one that is, that was, and is to come. Because whenever he says, whatever he says doesn't just come to be. It, is, it, it, it exists as though it has always existed. Let me say that again slowly because I want to make sure that we're getting it. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, God said, let there be light and there was light. It says, let there be, present tense. But the result was recorded in past tense simply because the moment he said it, it already happened. So by the time whoever was there was testifying, and we know the people who were there, the Bible says that the angels were applauding and singing praises as they saw the work of his creation. When God was in his creative process, making everything else, as the trees were springing up, the angels were celebrating and rejoicing because they were the creations of day one. When God says, let there be light and there was light, that light was not just the ambient light that was present for God to see what he was doing. He was talking about all things of light. Every spirit that has operation of duties and functions within the rankings of God's creation were already spat out that very day and so when they were there all of what they experienced by the time they could tell it had already happened you see that level of urgency or no it's not even an urgency that level of express delivery is what God does and he hasn't stopped doing it that way the Bible says the spirit of God speaks expressly such that by the time you hear it it has already happened the prophet said once was it said but twice did I hear it that the excellency of power belongs to God. He heard it twice. He heard it in the present and he was given an opportunity to hear it in the past. It was, it was echoing from the boundaries of eternity. And so when God says it, we have the expectation. Someone says, oh, Brother Moses, I, I've learned not to be too anticipatory because there are times when I believed that God spoke and I had an expectation. I even boasted to my friends that God has spoken. You know, myself and the pastor, we had a pre-fulfillment party just because we believe. We, I bought a key ring because I knew the car was coming as a demonstration of my faith. You know, because God already said he was going to give me that house in that neighborhood. In fact, I lobbied to get my children in school there and eventually it didn't happen. So I've learned to just wait. God will do what he wants to do. You can get used to several things in life, but do not get used to disappointments. You understand what I mean? Because there is zero advantages. There is no advantage to getting used to disappointments. There isn't any. You're like, oh yeah, but if I'm not disappointed, I'm not going to feel bad. This is excellent. Thank you. I'm not going to feel bad. But whether it happens in the time of your expectation or in the manner of your anticipation, you still do not have any reason to feel bad unless you doubt that God is good. Let me say that again. If you believe that God is good, then there is no reason for you to have such feeling toward God. Remember the, the parable of the talents. The guy that was given one, Somebody had five, the other had, I think, two. He was given one. Why was he unable to produce? Because he assessed what he had compared to other people and came to a conclusion that the master was, a was, was, was not being impartial. He came to the conclusion that the master was not a good master. And that was why he said, Knowing that you are a wicked master, I kept your coin for you. In fact, I buried it in the ground so that it doesn't accidentally multiply. 
I buried it in the ground because if he had left it on the table, someone may have borrowed it and then returned it with an interest. He says, no, so that it doesn't accidentally happen. I buried it in the ground. Why did he bury it in the ground? Because his assessment of the master was already unwholesome. And so the reason why many of us bury our joy in the ground, the reason why many of us bury the peace that he has given to us in the ground and we bury the only anticipation that we have in the ground is because we think God is sometimes good. But if you know that God is good all the time, even when what you expect did not happen how you expect it, you should be able to say, like Job said, all the days of my vain life, I will wait until my change comes. Many of us, we do not recognize that when God says a thing, he does it and he already told us that he will do it in the time for the thing, not your time, but the time for the thing, for he makes all things beautiful in its time. So if I am confident that the goodness of God is infallible, infallible, if I am confident that the goodness of God is consistent, if I am confident that, confident that God is good, then what do I do all the time? All the time I have a righteous expectation because if God says he's going to give you that car and that car did not happen are you still alive can this still happen yes it can and if he told you that he was going to give you on a tuesday who told you that it was tuesday last week what if it's tuesday next week you understand what i mean he told abraham that he would give him a son but the way he sounded or i mean the way abraham perceived it abraham thought oh the son was going to come out next week it didn't even come the next year. The sun did not even come the next decade. That sun waited until the next century to show up. But God was not at fault because God did not say, on the 12th day of October, you will have a son. He never said that. Hint, hint, that's my birthday anyway, so in case you're trying to, planning to buy me a tie. Shameless. Yeah. Yeah. Shameless, shameless indicator. Sounds like a movie. Oh, sleepless in Seattle. Okay. But that is God. He says it. He does it. He wants you to trust him. Trust God enough to do it at the right time. Because we trust God that he is able. But some of us don't trust how he does things. I know God, you will come through for me. But because a thousand days, a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. I can't really trust your timing. That means you do not trust him because God is one. So it's either you trust him or you don't. You can't trust parts of God. He's called the most holy. That means he has this consistency of character. That's what holiness means, purity in character. And so trust him completely and wholly because he will do it. I say that because of the fact that we have a word from God. And I do not want you to miss out simply because you checked out. Do not check out on God. Wait until you receive the fulfillment. Why? Once again, I say to you, we have a hope that the Bible says makes not ashamed. So going back to this subject, in fact, let us pray because I said we're going to pray. Father, with the matter name of Jesus, I pray that the wind of your love the power of your mercy will raise each and every one of us this very moment to the side of the rock wherein we can see your glory. I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus that we will be lifted up to see what you have said. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I am following here today what you have instructed us to do. Ask and you shall receive. And so I'm asking Lord this day on behalf of all of my brethren present here, on the behalf of every single one of us that have received this word of the great breakthrough miracle that you are doing in our lives this week. I am asking that we will see so that we may know where to go, what to anticipate in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, for this holy, gracious levitation, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 
A couple of things that I'm going to explain to you very quickly about the vision that I saw and the reason why I said we needed to pray is as I was looking, I was actually looking in your direction and what I saw was I saw you peeking around the mountain to see what God has said. And then that was when it just hit me that we needed to pray. Not intellectually, but instructionally. I had an instruction that we needed to pray for every one of us to be able to see it. You cannot enter a door that you have not seen. Jesus says in John chapter 3 verse 3, he said to Nicodemus, when Nicodemus asked him, what must I do to be saved? I believe we're coming into a season of very aggressive and intentional evangelism. Because this John chapter 3 verse 3 keeps coming up in the last couple of weeks where we keep talking about what it means to be born again. At least if you haven't paid attention or read it on your own or memorized it, just listen to these messages long enough, you will know John chapter 3 verse 3, John chapter 3 verse 5, John chapter 3 verse 14, John chapter 3 verse 16. You will know all of the John chapter 3's that are essential to soul winning and witnessing. And so Nicodemus said to Jesus, he asked him, what must I do to be saved? The word Nicodemus is an interesting name. It actually means someone with a mindset of victory. The word Nicodemus means victorious. And so he asked Jesus because he had his mind set on being victorious. He said, what must I do to be saved? Of all the Pharisees in the time of Jesus, and there were many, they were enough to have intimidated the governor. Remember Pontius Pilate was the governor and the Pharisees and the members of the Sanhedrin were enough to intimidate him to the point wherein he says, you can crucify whoever you want. Don't kill me. So they're not just one or two people. They were a sect of people and a formidable force. And yet it was only one of them who came to find Jesus at night. The Bible says that narrow is the way and difficult it is the path unto life and only a few find it. Not many people came to look for Jesus, but Nicodemus came to look for Jesus. And Jesus was like, okay, this guy must be intent on finding the way. Jesus is the way. So the fact that he came looking, he was already looking in the right place. And what did Jesus say to him? Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That is the first condition. You have to be able to see it. And then in verse five, Jesus said to him, after a little bit of a debate, because he was debating what Jesus had said, Jesus said, unless a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The order of penetration when it comes to accessing the kingdom of God begins with being able to see it. You have to be able to see it to receive it. I say that again, and I'm going to give you an example. One of my favorite examples in scripture. After God told Abraham that Abraham would have a son, Abraham somewhat believed it, but he couldn't conceptualize it. He couldn't see it. And so every time God came to visit him, God could tell that he kind of working with an imaginary concept of what it means to be a father. And so God was like, we need to help this dude. We're going to change your name. So the more people call you, the more you will have an opportunity to see yourself as a father. God says, you've been called a noble man, Abram. He said, but now you will be called father of many nations. And so when they started calling him father of many nations, he was beginning to get it. And God also added to that the concept of giving him a picture to work with. He says, Abraham, you're still struggling. Let me help you out. Come to this place. Meet me here at so, so, so time. And he met God and God says, look at the stars. Can you see how innumerable they are? That is how your children, your descendants will be. That was how God worked on Abraham's psyche to the point wherein Abraham was able to visualize what God was saying. Abraham was called the father of faith, but he struggled in the area of visualization. And God needed him to be able to visualize possibilities until he gave him Isaac. Otherwise, he would not have been able to surrender Isaac when the test came. 
You see what I'm saying? He was able to visualize things before God gave him Isaac. Everything that you have asked God for that is good for you, that is in accordance to his will, he wants to give it to you, but he doesn't want to give it to you until you have overcome certain limitations so that you do not abort your own miracle. If God had given Isaac to Abraham, just because oh, God says, oh, Abraham is my friend and I love him and I want him not to worry anymore. People are ridiculing this guy. Even the lot that he kind of adopted is being kind of like, you know, on, on his own. He says, I have promised you I will do it, but I need to make sure that I do it at a time wherein you have the maturity to be able to handle it. God is not going to give you more than you can handle. And that includes blessings. God knows, Kanita, that if he gives you five vehicles today, it may not be as much of a blessing after all. Because now you have five insurance policies that you have to worry about. And then you're going to be late everywhere you go because you just can't decide which one to drive. They say, oh, let's go to the grocery store and you're there. Mini, mini, mani, mo. And you're like, oh, let me start again. It might not be as much of a blessing and God knows it. But quite often, because we have not settled within us that God is good, we question God's prerogative for, for doing what he does, which sometimes appears to be delay or outright denial, whereas in fact it is an expression of his love to ensure that you are ready for the blessing that is ready for you. You understand what I'm saying? And so Abraham needed to be walked upon. And one of the things that God was working on was Abraham's ability to see the invisible. And so God kept showing him the stars. And then they'll have another conversation and it would sound like an unbeliever all over again. And God is like, man, what do we do? What do we do? How do we help this dude? Because every time they show him a picture and before you know what's going on, he's forgotten. Someone stands in front of him. He feels intimidated. He tells lies through his teeth. And God is like, if you already know who you are and you can see it, you will not be intimidated by this dude. What does he even have? You understand what I mean? And so God expects you to be able to see the kingdom before you enter the kingdom. In case you haven't noticed, John chapter 3 verse 3 comes before verse 5. Oh yes, because that seeing has to come before entering. And that is the reason why the Bible says in here that many people are unable to find the way. Why can't they find it? Because they can't see it. Everything that God has said to us, God expects for us to be able to see it. He expects us to be able to visualize it. And that is the reason why he made a commitment to you that he will do everything that you ask and everything that you can see. He says, I will do exceedingly abundantly above all of what you ask or imagine. So you have to be able to imagine it. You have to be able to visualize it. And I'm going to explain to us very quickly why it is important for you, it is important to God for you to be able to see it before you get into it. Because I know some of y'all might be thinking, well, if you want me in the kingdom, just bring me into the kingdom already. Why do I need to see it? Why do I, why do I need to stand and be gazing at the kingdom and be looking at it? Jesus explains the reason in verse 14 of John chapter 3. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, that as many people as look unto him will be saved. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, where we have been is such that we got there because of what we saw. And so for us to get out of there, it also has to be, it has to be because of what we see. Man fell because of what the woman saw. The Bible says Eve looked at the fruit and she saw that it was good for food. And so we fell by looking, we're going to rise by looking. Because we need to delete the old picture and put and replace it with a new picture. Many of us, all that we have seen is disappointment. All that we have seen is the recklessness of man. All we have seen is the, is the ruthlessness of the system. And that is the reason why you cannot conceive and receive the goodness of God. Because every time you think about God, you see a tyrant. And God is like, well, that's not who I am. That's why you cannot find me. 
The Bible says whoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is and that also he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Are you able to see him as someone who has completely given himself to you? Because if you can't see that, you cannot receive that. We need to turn loose our imagination. In Genesis chapter 11, man had received borrowed technology from the fallen angels. They had learned how to make bricks. They had learned even how to make asphalt. Pretty much the same asphalt that you have on the road now. Just a few hundred years into human existence, they learned it from the fallen angels. Because God told us that they were making, they were using brick for stone and using asphalt instead of mortar. Mortar is more naturally occurring. Brick or stone is naturally occurring. But they were using things from alien technology. And God is like, with what they have and what they're doing, they have become dangerous to themselves. Do you know that even with the technology that they were using and the plan that they had and the resources available to them, God was not as concerned about all of those things as he was about their imagination. The Lord says in Genesis chapter 11, he says, now let us go down and confuse their language and stop them from being one people. He said, because if we don't, there is nothing that they imagined to do that would be impossible unto them. So God himself has established that if you can and see it, then it is over. Nothing that you are able to imagine will be impossible unto you. Not my words, God said it. But let me tell you something, the difference between the way that I am saying it and the way that I want you to receive it and the way motivational speakers say it is because motivational speakers are always telling you to imagine it, to see it, to, con to, to concord the picture in your mind and that is the foundation of all disappointments because you can fabricate a picture for, for yourself that is not from the heart of God. You can see your own kingdom Instead of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, if you would be born again, then you will see the kingdom of God. But many of us do not wait for God to show us his picture. We don't wait to receive his picture. We make up our own picture and that is not his kingdom. That is your kingdom. And you may not be able to actualize that kingdom because it is subject to your own abilities and the arm of flesh shall fail. So I need to be able to see in my imagination, that which has come by revelation. And that is why we need help because Moses could not see the glory of God. God had spent years describing to Moses, demonstrating to Moses his glory and Moses still could not see it until God took him and set him by the side of the mountain and placed him upon the rock. And he says, from here, you will see. And what is that rock? We know that rock is the word of God, the Lord Jesus. So for me to see, I need the leverage of revelation. For me to see, See, I need the advantage of inspiration. For me to see, I need a picture from heaven. Otherwise, I will not see. And if I don't see, I cannot find the way that leads to life. And that is the reason why many people are building their own castles rather than being part of what God is building. We're going to read that Matthew chapter 7 again. And we're going to read verse 14 and then go to verse 7. If I let's quickly go to verse 14. Yeah. 7. Let's go to 7. 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Why? Because it's already established by God in heaven and on the earth that he who, verse eight, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. There is interest, it's, it's actually interesting the way it was worded. The Bible says everyone who seeks. So that is as general as it comes. Everyone, whosoever seeks will find. But him, which means anybody in particular, who seeks will find. He says, but he, that means we're going from a general pool of people that are given the opportunity and then we'll come to the ones who are called and then we have come to the ones who have been chosen. If you see what happened there, you will recognize that many people ask, they receive and stop there. 
if a fewer number of people work on what they have received and only a fraction of the general populace actually goes ahead to flush the handle after they have knocked to go in. I'm going to explain it in another way because I realize that there are people here who haven't heard me, who may not have heard me teach on Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. I'm going to give you the same analogy that I've given very quickly. You see, if I am going to Brother Greg's house and I've never been to his house, I don't know where he lives. I know he comes from somewhere because he drives here in a car. He's not levitating and floating with wings. So if I want to go to his house and fellowship with him, what do I do? The first thing I have to do is not knock because what am I going to be knocking? His head? No. I ask him, where do you stay? And then I will receive an address. So I ask and I receive an address. Once you receive the address, do you automatically know where the address is? Even if you're a cab driver of 45 years, you don't automatically know. Because there's no cab driver that has driven around the world. They probably know downtown, but they don't know where he lives. So what do you do? You have asked, you have received. So that which you have received is a pointer to how you need to seek and what you are seeking. So the address now becomes the guide for me to take with me as I go to seek out the house referenced by the address. So what have I done? I have asked and now I am going to seek where he lives. Now imagine if after asking for the address and he was kind enough to give me, trusting enough to give me, you know, because it's not everybody you give your address to because the thief comes now but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So you need to make sure that you're giving it to someone who will come and give you life by Christ Jesus. And so if he's trusting enough to give me the address, I have to be committed enough and appreciative enough to seek it out. And so once I finally seek it out, what does the Bible guarantee me? The word of God guarantees that if I seek it, I will find it. So imagine if I get to the front of the house, I have found it quite all right. And I keep smiling, expecting him to somehow magically know that I have arrived. Imagine me arriving at night. I would have to smile a lot before he knows I'm there. You understand what I mean? And so what do I do? I make my presence known. And that went over some people's heads. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> so what do I do? I make my presence known and I communicate my intention for penetration because I want to get into that place. I didn't come to say hello to his gate. I didn't come to say hello to the bushes in front of his house. I have come to see and to have fellowship. So no matter how close I am to the promise, it is not enough until I have got into the promise. So what do I do? I knock. And then I allow for him to let me in. The blessings of life are all behind gates and doors. The Bible says, lift up your head, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And let the king of glory come in. Why everlasting doors? Because God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Where? In heavenly places. And so those everlasting doors, those eternal doors, are the ones that are standing between you, your faith, and your blessings. And so many of us have received the word from God in the past. And you say, Brother Moses, the reason why I don't have an expectation this time around to receive anything is because I don't want to be disappointed. Quite all right. God gave you a word in the past. He gave you a word because you asked for him to help you. And he, sends, he sent you his word. Because when you ask God, what does he give you? He gives you his word. The Bible says they have sought the Lord in humility and in gladness of heart. And he has given to them his word that heals them freely. When you ask what you receive is a word. And the word is a descriptor to where your blessing lies. But you need to search it out. So it's not God's fault that you have been disappointed one time after the other. It is not God's fault that you have not taken possession of all of what he has for you. It is because you have not found it. You have received a word, but then you need to go and seek it out. What is the process of seeking out the address? 
I look at where I'm at and then use my current location to determine how to proceed toward my destination. Many of us, God gives us a word that in 18 months you will no longer be single, but the Lord would allow for you to be married, but you do not apply that same word to your current situation. And that word wants to reveal to you that you are too argumentative. That word wants to reveal to you that where you're at is a place of lack of patience. The word wants to reveal to you that you are in a place of lack of understanding. And so because you don't know where you're at, you don't know how to proceed to where you need to be. I put in my GPS when I am going to Brother Greg's house, my destination. Because even the GPS is smart enough to know, to ask me, where are you? Nobody ever just goes to B. You go from A to B. But guess what? The reason why you don't get to Brother Greg's house is God's problem. It's Brother Greg's problem. He gave you the address, but he didn't tell you how to get there. God is like, I'm not looking for children that I'm going to spoon feed. The glory of God, it is. The Bible says it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. And it is the glory of kings to search it out. God is looking to raise kings, not idiots. He's looking to raise kings, not imbeciles. He's looking to raise kings and not just lazy bombs. And that is the reason why he wants you to search out your salvation with fear and with trembling. Do something about what he has already given to you and more shall be revealed. This is the reason why only a few find it because people don't want to work anymore. They just want to drive through and God is like, we don't do fast foods here. We do good meals. Fast food saved nobody ever. <laughs> Let me tell you something. The danger of quick pleasure <laughs> is that it is always coming to take from you rather than give to you. The Lord God Almighty has set out a blueprint and God is always very upfront. From the beginning, he tells you what he's looking for. He says, I'm going to take of myself and I'm going to make man in my image and in my likeness. I'm going to equip him but I want him to have dominion. I'm not just making a man that will crawl along with the lizards. I'm not just making a man that is gonna bump his head into things like a buffalo. I am making a man who is gonna be above always and not beneath. I am making him to have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and every cattle and all creeping things that creep on the face of the earth. Do you think you can do that by just sitting on your tail all the time and expecting the angels to bring you breakfast, lunch, and dinner? You need to learn how to seek things out. Identify your current location. I want to go from here because if I don't know that I am in Lawrenceville and I want to go to Marietta, yeah, which would take the grace of God. <laughs> because I don't just wake up and say that I'm going to Marietta. So let's use another example so that I don't even get angry in the spirit. So let's say I'm going from here and I am going to, Con oh, not Conyers. No, the ones that we know in Conyers, we're trying to redeem them from Conyers. <laughs> Say now, my time. Oh yeah, because I used to live in Conyers. The first time I came to America, I stayed in Conyers. Loneliness had the better of me. So I don't even like to think about Conyers. God bless you all. We appreciate your sacrifice. But time up. Come on now. Time up. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's a man of faith. He's receiving it with both hands and with a lovely smile. You see, when you receive it with gladness, it is able to save your soul. I need to first of all know where I'm at. And where I'm at is going to tell me how to get to where I'm going. Do you know that your direction is line by line? Step by step. The Lord is not just going to tell you, jump on 400. No. No. Because he knows that the order of things is that a line has to be upon the line and the precept has to be upon the precept. And so if God is still working with me on how to get from where I'm at to the very next street right in front of my subdivision, I don't have to complain. I don't have to be in a hurry. I just have to let him do his perfect work in me. I need to see that I am walking and making progress. Remember about two weeks ago, we talked about what it means to walk in the spirit. What it means to walk in the spirit is to be able to take one step 
step in the spirit and take the next in the spirit. So you don't take one step in the spirit and you take another step in the flesh. Those who do that, the Bible says they never move. Gavin, I want you to come and stand in here if you don't mind me using you as an example. Come on now, let's celebrate Gavin, everybody. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, he, he's old enough to be on TV, isn't he? Yeah, that is verbal parental consent. And so Gavin here is a messenger that the Lord has sent to me. And I am here in the place wherein God answered me. I asked and he sent me his word. And that word contains the descriptor of my journey from where I'm at to where I need to be to encounter the help that God has sent. But for me to get to that place, I need to be able to take steps. I need to be able to walk by faith in the spirit to where my messenger is. Because your messengers are of angelic proportion, which means they are operating always as though they are spirit beings, even if they're natural people. Because the word angel means messenger. And the Bible says he makes his angels flames of fire. It makes his, it makes his angels flames of fire and his ministers. What? You got it backwards. Let's ask another Bible scholar. Rosemary is letting us down today. Ah. <laughs> he makes his, his ministers spirits and his angels flames of fire. So when they operate, they operate in the spirit. And so what do you do? You need to be in the spirit to receive the ones that God has sent to you. Do you know how many people have come to you to ask for help or something within you would just not let you help them? You are the same person that God has sent to them to show them their next house. But when they come to you, something just isn't right. Even though you try to help them, you just can't find what they need simply because they have not come to you in the spirit. So they are coming to just a man when they should be coming to an angel. Many of us have, we have continually walked past the people that are ordained by God to be the connectors between here and there, but we always walk past them. The Bible lets us know that many have passed by angels unwittingly just because they didn't know. And so how do you find what is in the spirit? You be in the spirit. And what does it mean to be in the spirit? To walk in the spirit. To walk is very simple. God could have used another word that is more difficult. But he used the word walk because it's one of the very first things we learn to do in this life. To walk. So I take one step in the spirit toward Gavin. And I'm only going to get closer if I can manage another step in the spirit. But many of us, this is what we do on Monday. We are in the spirit because God is telling us to delete certain numbers from our phones. And we delete those numbers. And then Tuesday comes because your flesh is nagging at you like Delilah was nagging at something. You go online and you ask somebody else for that same phone number that you have deleted. And the Bible says a double-minded man is a stable in all his ways. Let not such a fellow expect to receive anything of the Lord because they are valley Satan going back and forth, flip flopping like a bathroom slippers. That's why the bathroom slippers never leaves the house because it keeps flip flopping. Unless, of course, you're going to Walmart because you see a lot of those. But here is the deal, y'all. For me to be able to engage my help, I need to be consistent in the spirit. Take one step after another step. And one thing about when you're taking steps is that the moment you take a step in the spirit, the rest of your weight, of the weight comes upon your flesh. And that is the reason why your flesh makes you feel like you're about to die if you continue that fast one more day. So what do you do? You take that one step in the spirit and expect your flesh to complain because all the weight is now on the flesh. But what did Paul teach us to do? Paul says, I put my body under. You're not going to stop me from taking that next step in the spirit. And if I keep taking one step after another, obeying what the word of the Lord is saying to me, I will engage my help. We will shake hands and something is going to transpire, which is the fulfillment of the grace of God. God bless you guys. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But if you don't know where you're at, you will always make the wrong turn. So let the word of God, don't be afraid for God to reveal to you where you're at. When he made you, he made you out of the dust of the earth. That was a clue for you to know that you're not perfect until you become glorified. 
The Holy Spirit had to say to me, it says, you've been running after perfection. He says, but in a corrupt world, there's no perfection until all things have been made new. Because how do you want to attain perfection when everything's been made corrupt? So you replace a brick with another broken one. He says, you need to focus on execution and let Jesus take care of perfection. And so I am not waiting to impress God. I am not attempting to seem perfect before him. I just need to learn how to take one step at a time. And so God knows exactly where I'm at. And so if he already knows where I'm at, why should I be afraid to let his word examine me? The Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord and with it the Lord searches the inward parts of his belly. So when David had that revelation, he turned to God and he says, examine my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me. I am not afraid to stand before the Lord and say, God, what is it that I am hiding from you? What is it that I have buried in the ground that is making me feel like you're not a good God? Because the one who buried his talent began to feel like the master was a wicked master. The moment you bring out that which is on the inside of you that you've been hiding from God, then you begin to have a sense of appreciation for a good God who found you worthy to even get you started. He got you started. Never forget that. He that has begun a good work in you is faithful and just to bring it to a perfect completion. So what do you do after you have received the direction? You begin to follow the direction to get to your destination. And when you get to your destination, if anything precious exists in that definition, in that destination, it's not going to be on the side curb. If there's anything precious there, it will be in the house. And so that's why the Bible says, he that asks, receives. He that seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door shall be opened to him. How do you knock? We know how we knock in the natural. We take our knuckles and we bang the door. Sometimes they may have some of those fancy things made out of brass. What do they call them? A, do a door, whatever. And then you knock. But basically, what are you doing? Let's, let's have another scenario. Diamond, I want you to go. Yes. Praise the Lord. At least now you can check that off. Your bucket list, you have been used as an example. Praise the Lord. Can you please come close? Let's have a conversation, right? So when I get to your house, for example, and I knock, what do you say? Who is it? Why are you asking? Because <laughs> I don't know who you are. You need to validate my identity. <laughs> so three things just happened there. I arrived at the destination and I made my presence known. And then you questioned first my identity. Diamond doesn't say, oh, what time do you call this? No, before you're worried whether the person is early or late, it's not the timing that is as important as the identity to see if that is the person that you have been expecting. And then if I say, oh, it's me. Your husband said I should bring this. What do you say? Okay. <laughs> okay, Diamond, thank you. You can be seated. Wow, really, Diamond? Okay. So what do you say? You're like, oh, I've been expecting you. Wait for me, I am coming. What do you do? You announce that you have acknowledged who I am. But all that is going on and I'm still outside. Please be seated and I'll tell you what follows. Praise God. At least now, we know the kind of example that Diamond falls into. Where's Matthew? Oh, he's not here today. When you get to the place of your blessing. You need to be confident enough to be able to say that you are there. You don't get two blocks away and be knocking at the lamp post. <laughs> Nobody does that, at least not in their right minds. You would have had to smoke a lot of stuff and engage the ministry of a lot of demons <laughs> to be two blocks away and be knocking and say, I am here. You must have drunk a lot of stuff. You know some people when they're drunk, they can't go home because every roundabout they get to, they don't know the exit. They just keep going around until their gas finishes. I know somebody like that, but I'm not going to tell on him today. 
I'm, in, I'm being nice today. But you don't get two blocks away and be knocking. What do you do before you knock? Before you knock, you validate that the number on that door matches what is on the address. Mm. Women in the house who are looking for husbands, husbands who are looking for wives, when you stand in front of that person, don't just conclude that that is house number 17. It could be number 71. You need to check what is written on the door against what is written in the address. You see, Satan is still in the business of creating counterfeit blessings to stop us from possessing the original. House number nine is not the same thing as house number six. Make sure that they haven't messed with the address. Make sure that it is not six upside down. You see, many of us, the reason why we can't find the house just yet is because God knows that you have not learned how to read as you should. God knows that you have not learned how to read. And what does it mean to read? To be able to inspect the fruits because it is by their fruits that we shall know them. And so while you yourself have not become familiar enough with the fruits of the spirit, how can you identify fruit in somebody else? And God is like, they can't find the house just yet because they will misread the number. The manifold wisdom of God. You see, the wisdom of God executes the love of God. The love of God is brought to you by the wisdom of God. And that is the reason why God, by his wisdom, will not allow for certain things to be easy for you simply because he knows that if you get there too quickly, you will be broken and they will not be ready and together both of you will be washed away, aborted. It's okay to go around the mountain if that is what is going to save your soul. Just don't go around the mountain until you are worn out. Remember the children of Israel, majority of them kept going around the mountain until they actually wore out the allowances that were given to them. And God is like, I'm not going to wait forever because Joshua and Caleb are ready and they will go and the rest of you will be gone. Only a few find it. Here are some of the reasons. Well, not some of the reasons. Here are the reasons by kingdom principle why people don't find the way. Because it is narrow. God is not sending you to all the houses in an apartment complex. He's not sending you to all the houses in a neighborhood. He's sending you to a particular house. And you have to be able to use spiritual intelligence by obedience to narrow it down to house number 17. You need to know that that is exactly where you are going. And before you knock, because if you knock the wrong house, the owner of the house may choose to stand his ground and you do not want to become a victim of accidental arrival. No, you don't. But that's what happened to so many people. The reason why that lady believes that God does not want her to be married is because she showed up at the wrong door and the guy came out and messed her up. And she's like, you see, God told me that I should be expecting. And the next man that I saw, see what he did to me. And that's because you knocked the wrong door. You just didn't look properly. That was not a man. That was a beast. It, he's, it doesn't look like that because he's been working out. No, he looks like that because he's possessed by demons. He is a beast and that's not where God sent you. God knew the address of the beast and he didn't send you there because he's saving the beast for another day. The Bible says all things are available at God's disposal. Even the wicked is there for the day of trouble. Hallelujah. And so here is the deal, y'all. What you do are those three things that transpired when I was talking to Diamond in that very first conversation. You announce your arrival after you have verified that you have come to the right place that God describes. Many of us are too impatient, too carnal, and too full of our own ways of thinking to recognize what God really has for us. And when we don't get it, we say it is God. No, it isn't God because he is faithful. He never fails. It's you. And me. And so, if we have run into the wall a couple of times, 
We don't have to make it a, a tradition. The Bible says repent from dead works. And so I want to encourage you today, folks. Learn to verify that that which was promised is what you're looking at by the word of God. Don't be afraid to ask questions. The Bible says he knows who quests to know. Ask questions. Verify. Are you who God says you are? Show me the fruits. I've seen some already, but I want to do more investigation. I want to see more because the Bible says let every man be fully persuaded. God expects you to do the work of persuasion. Don't just do the work of assumptions because at the end of the day, you will be the one to give an account. And then the person on the inside will challenge your identity. And that is why it is important for you to know who you are. Why am I even expecting this particular blessing from God? Is this part of my equipping? Do people like me in ministry and by my calling, do people like me by my training and readiness receive things like this? Because some of you, you receive things or you're presented with things that you're not prepared for and you know it in your heart. But you're like, come on, who's going to say no to that? You should. Because God will not give you more than you can handle, but Satan will. You've never read the Bible from cover to cover and they're offering you a second job and you want to take it because you want to save money so you can go to Belize. No, no, let me say that again. You have never read the word, you have never read the Bible cover to cover. You don't even know. Is she planning to go to Belize? Oh, is that where you went to the other day? And you saw what happened? Your trip was cut short. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How be it, I prophesied. Let me tell you something, men and women of God. I tell you this, you have no business taking that second job because you want to save for a vacation wherein you have not even spent time seeking out the truth of the word of God concerning your destiny and your assignment. Thank you guys, I appreciate that. That means speed up. In fact, I think my wife says no, not speed up, round up. Oh yes. But we have to round up some weeds, first of all. If you, if you know, you know. But here is the deal. Folks, your identity is going to be challenged. There are certain things that you're not ready for. So don't let Satan offer you a second job because you want to save extra money. Wherein, you see, God did not call you to save money. He called you to save souls, beginning with yours. You need to save your soul from the number one destroyer on earth. What is the number one destroyer on earth? Someone says Satan. Uh, two over ten. The number one destroyer is ignorance. God was the one who identified it to us. He said my people perish for lack of knowledge. If you're not ignorant, even Satan cannot overpower you. That's why the Bible says, do not be ignorant of the devices of the devil. Why give place to the enemy? So what do you do? You see that and you're like, oh, second jobs. That's not for me. Right now, what I need is second chronicles. <laughs> yeah. People don't read things like Second Chronicles unless they're having trouble sleeping. They put you to sleep real quick. Yeah, you have to read it when you're very alert. But Second Chronicles is full of mysteries. Chapter 29 is my favorite. It tells you how to have a heart for the house and the principles of being able to ensure that you get into God's presence every time they make a call. Second Chronicles 29, powerful weapon. Anyway, you don't need a second job, you need Second Chronicles. And so when you get there, make sure that you are ready to answer when your identity is being challenged. Diamond was like, who is it? I said, it is I. And I have to identify myself based on the authorization that I have to be in front of that particular door. I am here. Remember, we have an appointment. I am here. Someone sent me. You don't just show up and say, I am here because I feel like. No. You have to be intentional. You have to be purposeful. 
Let me say that again. Still on the issue of finding spouses. Many people arrive in front of the right person, but they do not have clarity of expression. When God brought Eve to Adam, Adam didn't just say, oh, she's the looker. No, he said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called a woman. He identified her by what? By her purpose. What is the meaning of a woman? A woman is a man with a womb. If you do not have a womb, please go home. You're a dude. It is there in Romans chapter 1. The Bible says because the fathers have forgotten to teach the knowledge of God. The children will be given to a reprobate mind. And they will forget the original purpose of a woman. And begin to do things that they shouldn't. When you forget the original purpose of a woman, it's over. Then you can't define a woman because God has already given the definition. Can we stick with it please? Yeah. It is like when you, when you purchase that car of your dreams, that BMW X3 that keeps you up at night praying and speaking in tongues. When you finally get it, the manufacturer says, this is an airbag. You don't open it and go shopping and put your groceries in it. <laughs> it's a bag, quite all right. If you've seen one, it looks like a Kroger bag, just lighter in color. But it is the manufacturer's description that you have to honor. It is called sense. <laughs> What's going on there? <laughs> All right, I see you. I see you, and God is good. You see, it says, you do what the Lord says, and he says when you get there, make yourself known. God told Abe Moses how to identify himself to Pharaoh. He told Moses how to identify himself to the children based on the purpose of his assignment. I don't just show up and say, I like you, marry me, because I don't like sleeping alone. No. I needed more than that, especially for this one. Oh yeah, because my wife was one of those people, just by looking at you, you can tell she's asking, where are you going in life? You need to have that kind of gaze that can question people so that you sift out the chaff very quickly. Otherwise, you will entertain every Tom, Dick, and Harry. And you wonder why you're so tired. You're tired because you're serving people that have not paid to eat at your restaurant. The Bible says, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. You knock gallantly, confidently. Because you know who you are and the reason why you're there. Because you will be challenged. Many of us, we have labored to get to the place of our blessing, but we have not been able to receive the blessing because the blessing itself is not confident enough to receive you. Remember, your blessings are not dumb. God does not give us dummy blessings. The Bible says your blessings, every single one of your blessings is a spiritual blessing. Your blessings are intelligent. It's like gold. Ask anybody who is into mining gold, you ask them, even this, even though this sounds like a fantasy, gold in the ground avoids certain people. They dig and dig and they're like, the machine said the gold is here. And then you dig and suddenly you don't find it anymore. Because it's a reflection. The Bible says from the things that are in the natural, we have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God and of eternity. So your blessings, your re-blessings are not dummies that you pick up a shelf. They are spirits that can interrogate you and that will interrogate you. And so that is the reason why you have to be ready to be received by your blessing if you will receive your blessing. Do you think if Adam had looked at Eve and said to God, uh, is this one of, the, one of the animals? Is this an angel? I don't know. Eve would have said to God, uh, he's not ready. Can we go back to heaven when he's ready? Give me a call. You still have my number? But because he spoke with confidence, the woman was able to follow because it was already settled. That's why he was allowed in. Be ready to tell your blessing that you have arrived and it's time for you to be connected. Because that blessing will question you. It's a spiritual blessing until you possess it. You have to be the one to tame that blessing. Mm, and got it. 
I think she did. Or I hope she did. And I hope that's what the laughter is about. But at the end of the day, we're going to break bread. And we're going to break bread today from the book of Obadiah. Oh yes, you know we were in Obadiah just a couple of days ago. Yeah, we're not done. We kind of like, you know, we, we need to do that Obadiah 14 again. And if you're looking for Obadiah in your Bible, you're not alone. <laughs> the book of Obadiah is right after the book of Amos. Amos, the burden bearer. If you wonder what the name Amos, what it means, it means the one that bears a burden. And that is the reason why it is said in Amos chapter 3 verse 3 that two shall not work, walk together unless they are in agreement. Otherwise, the load is going to be one-sided. Okay, Amos and then Obadiah. It's a tough one to find because it's only one chapter. And so if you skip too quickly or you fat finger it, you will never find it. But I pray you find it in Jesus' name. So today, actually, let's go to, let's go to Obadiah 17. I, w- I was going to give us a detour, but let's just go straight to 17. Uh, my wife stopped smiling five minutes ago, which means time up. Oh, yeah. So, the number 17 that I've been using in the example is intentional because 17 is heaven's number of victory. God wants you to be victorious. 17 is the number of victory. And look at what Obadiah 17 says. Harabukum varabasa. I want you to read it. Okay, hold on, hold on. Before you read it, just be still. Let the Lord speak to you in this very precious moment. Remember, we're doing this for breaking bread. Hallelujah. So I want to quickly say something. I want to preface the utilization of this power. The power for victory. You see, in case you haven't made the connection, the word Obadiah is very similar to the word Obed. Remember Obed Edom. What does it mean? Edom means man. Obed means servant. Obed Edom. Obed means a servant. Obed Diah means the servant of the Ayah, which is Yehovah. Obedidah means the servant of God. So I am saying this almost as a disclaimer that what we're about to profess is a special privilege of the ones who have chosen to serve God with whatever he gives to them. Heaven doesn't just dish out victories blindly nor randomly. Heaven gives out vic- victories to the few who find the way. And who are the ones who find it? The ones who are intent on using it to the glory of God. So just an insight. When you study the book of Obadiah, it's loaded with principles. We looked at two of them primarily, or maybe even three on Saturday when we read Obadiah. We read those two verses in Obadiah and unveiled things to us. So this one that is in verse 17 is yet again another one of those special reservations for the ones who have chosen to be Obadiahs, to be the Obeds of the Ayah, to be the servants of the Almighty God. If you're willing and obedient, the Bible says you shall eat the fruit of the land. If you're willing to serve God with all of what he gives. If you're willing to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. If you're willing to say, Lord, I appreciate and recognize, I recognize and I appreciate in great gratitude or with great gratitude that you are the one that is at work in me, both the will and the do of your good pleasure. The miracles that you have been anticipating will begin to happen as though somebody set a domino effect into your life. God's miracles in your life are supposed to be like the chains. They're supposed to be like chains connected one to the other. One blessing should not finish before another one comes. It's not like your salary that finishes two weeks even before the next one comes. You understand what I mean? Some salaries actually finish before you get them. Yeah, yeah, that's not a blessing. That's a bait. Salaries are just there to, to, for you to keep coming back until you figure out exactly how you can make your own money. Unless you are earning a salary in the business that you're part owner of, 
then you're just pretending. That's not a salary, that's a dividend. You know what you're doing, okay? So don't be saying, oh, I'm demonizing salaries. No, I'm not. I'm just saying that the blessed, the intention of God is not for one to finish before another one comes. I didn't know that until one day my mom called me and she explained it to me. In fact, I don't remember the verse of scripture now, but there's a verse of scripture that talks about the fact that your blessings are supposed to be like dromedaries, like chains that are connected, looped one into another. Before one finishes, it brings another. Before one finishes, it brings another. Anyway, as we break bread today, that is what I'm seeing for some people here today, that it's time for them to enjoy a blessing that remains until another comes. The drought is over. Hallelujah. The drought is over. Praise the Lord. Obadiah chapter 17. God is good. Now you have asked and you have received. Now seek and you shall find. You see, I, I tell you all these things are connected. You know, on Saturday, the Lord said to us that we need to learn how to see the horses, to see the donkeys as watchmen, but also learn how to listen carefully because there is additional instruction on what to do about the donkeys and the chariots. It's not just based on what you see, you have to hear. So verse 17, without further ado, it says, but on Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. And there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possession. It is the will of God for you to possess your possession. For you to ask and receive. For you to seek and find. For you to knock and have the door open to you. So that you can come into your plenty. This is the will of God for you. But guess what the Bible says? It is for those who find Zion first. What is the importance of Zion? Zion is that height that gives you the advantage of perspective. It is the position that you occupy in God that allows for you to see what you're about to enter. Hmm. Even Manuel Lira was not as excited as I thought. I'm going to say that again. Please be excited. This is good news. <laughs> the, Bible, the Bible says on Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. Why? You need heaven's divine advantage to be able to see and visualize. It is important for you to see so that when you arrive, you already know. You know how useful it is for you to be able to see the street view of where you're going? Because sometimes your little navigation system, your GPS forgets to tell you whether the destination is on the left or on the right. You know, it says that you have arrived at your destination. Your destination is on the left. And sometimes the thing is too tired because even your GPS is not happy with the kind of music you listen to in your car. And your GPS is like, I'm not putting up with all this unholiness. And so he says, you've got into your destination, figure it out. I say that jokingly, but the reality of it is this. The Bible says, God speaking. He says, I'm sending you help. He says, but my angel, who is your help that is going ahead of you, he does not know how to forgive. So don't grieve this help. And so there are certain times that help is with us in the car as we're going, but we grieve the help. If you're a man in the house, you know exactly how difficult it is sometimes when your wife is aggrieved and then she can no longer help you read the map. And you're like, hey, honey, is it left or right? And she's like, I don't know. You know all things. <laughs> and you're like, if I get lost, we're all lost together. And she's like, and so? I'm not even interested in going anymore. Do not grieve your help. <laughs> anyway, let us break bread. I want us to say there is help for me. Because there is help in Zion. And I am of Zion. The city of the most high. Let me explain something beautiful to you about Zion. You see, Zion is relative to where God is. The Bible says, we will occupy the mountains of Zion that are around the mountain of God. So Zion is essentially being by God. And what was that verse of scripture that Alan took us through earlier on, earlier on? Talking about the fact that when Moses was about to see the glory of God, God said, I will bring you to my side and set your foot upon the rock. You need to be in Zion. You need to be close to God to see what he's showing you. And when you see what he's showing you, then you can possess your possession. It is the will of God for you to possess by first of all, occupying your place next to God. How many people are ready to 
be present in Zion. Ah, halle, halle, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let us, let us break bread. I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone. Father, we thank you because you have laid in Zion for a foundation of stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone that he who believes will not be put to shame. We stand upon that rock of ages. We stand upon your word. We receive, we find, and we enter. All by the leading of your Holy Spirit, all by your grace, all in your love. You may eat of the Lord's flesh and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Unto newness of life, unto alertness, and unto the understanding of revelation. In Jesus' name, you may eat. Father, we thank you for the bread that became wine, that became flesh, even the flesh of the Son of Man, Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for the wine that became his blood, the blood of propitiation and atonement for our sins, the blood of propitiation and re redemption. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let everyone here today that have received the utterances of the prophetic today, be more than excited, be energized. Be energized to be enlarged, to receive more, to be positioned to receive, beginning with that which they have left behind, to receive and to receive the more that they have not been able to receive. In the name of Jesus, I say that over you today, that blessings that you left behind because you couldn't answer the questions at the door, that the Lord will present to you those challenges again, which is just there to prove your identity and you will respond gallantly and victoriously and you will go in and possess your possessions in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you, communion house. See you Saturday by the grace of God. Ain't you glad you came tonight? Come on, somebody. Let's celebrate the Lord. Come on. Come on. God is good. God is good. We have the uh, given details. They're on the screen. If you need an envelope, we have them there. To my left, your right. We're going to go ahead and offer up to the Lord. Father, we give you praise. Try family online. There are several ways to give. We'll see the um, Zell information there as well as at Communion House for both PayPal and Cash App. And let's give in obedience. Let's give in our love. Let's give in faith tonight for all that the Lord has done. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for the company of innumerable angels you brought us to tonight, O oh God how you've ministered to us your mysteries and revealed them to us plainly, how you have detailed this season, how you have shown your mercy, O oh God, by allowing us to be revisited, O oh God, by those blessings that we've missed because of this thing or that thing. O oh God, we give you praise for we know that your mercy endures forever and it prevails in our life even at this very hour. Lord, these offerings, these things that you have given unto us, for we know you own the cattle on a thousand hill, let them be found pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling unto you. O oh God, fragrant. We declare that all glory and honor and power and might belong to you. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. Come on, somebody. Y'all better act like y'all know. This is our week for breakthrough. Come on. This will be a sign to many generations. For we've seen beyond the mountain, the Lord has allowed us to see. Hallelujah. We we're going to keep pressing into this this week because y'all know what time it is. Tomorrow, 9 p.m., Wednesday, Instagram Live. 
We're going to be pressing in in prayer one hour as the Lord has instructed us to do. So if you have not been a part of that yet, please find us on Instagram at Communion House and join us 9 p.m. And we will be back this Saturday. All righty, 630. Everyone have a blessed night.